Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I would like to go back to the late 1970s, the era of the home-built computer. Computer ownership was much different then. You couldn't just go to, on the internet, look at reviews, and then buy one. You had to design, build, and program your computer yourself because there was nobody else to do it. So why don't you join me as I look back at my home-built computer journey? Since I was little, I've always wanted a computer. Originally, the science fiction portrayal of giant electronic brains is what drew me in. But when I got my Digicomp 1, I realized the computers were big machines that could be made to solve problems. However, I grew up in a small town and I never saw a computer until I got to college in 1972. There, during my freshman orientation, another student showed me how to play chess with the computer. I was hooked. Over the course of the next several years, my computer programming courses were my favorite. I liked the whole process of writing programs, punching cards, feeding them into the card reader, and debugging the programs. However, because I was a mechanical engineering major, there was no opportunity for me to interface with the actual computer. It was this huge beast behind the glass window with servants tending to it. One night, after I had recently been jilted by a girl, my good friend took me to the computer lab. There I got to work one-on-one -on -one with a PDP-8S, an IBM 1620, and an IBM 1130. I just knew I had to have my own computer, but I could barely afford gas and food, let alone a computer. Then something magical happened. In January 1975, Popular Electronics published an article about the Altair 8800. The buzz was huge. I couldn't get my own copy of the magazine, but I read the article several times. I did buy part two in February and read that until the pages were torn and dog-eared. My friend and I decided to build our own microcomputers. However, the cost was prohibitive because the Intel chipset alone was $150. And that was just three chips. No memory, no interface, no nothing. So I waited. When I came back to school for my senior year, my friend told me about a new microprocessor chip that we could afford, the Moss Technology 6502. The chip was only $25. That was still pretty expensive, gas was 50 cents per gallon then, but we each ordered one with the associated documentation immediately. Using the documentation, we set out to design and build our own computers. As I mentioned earlier, there was no internet, no computer clubs, not even any magazines about microcomputers. My friend and I were the only ones building computers on the entire campus of 50,000 students, so we had to make up stuff as we went. Of course, people thought we were crazy. I got my first computer to operate in mid-1976. It was a 6502 with one kilobyte of memory and a hexadecimal front panel. That was it. Not only was the hexadecimal panel easier to use, it was actually cheaper because the conventional toggle switches and lights were very expensive. By this time, microcomputer clubs were starting to spring up. Some newsletters, like Dr. Dobbs, and magazines such as Byte and Kilobaud started up. This provided fuel for the growing microcomputer movement. The computer took a back seat in late 1976 and 1977 since I was busy starting two different jobs, moving to two different cities, and getting married. By late 1977, I had settled down and wanted my computer to do more. The first thing I needed was an ASCII input and output device. I couldn't afford the used teletype terminals that were available, and CRT terminals cost even more, so I decided to build Don Lancaster's TV typewriter. His book described the circuit and provided sample schematics, but I had to glue all the pieces together. However, after several months, I was able to get my terminal to work. Next, I had to interface my computer to the terminal. However, my current design was not expandable. So I completely redesigned it to work with the TIM chip that I had examined in an earlier video and built a card cage that would allow expansion. At the same time, I added a KC tape interface that I could use to save and load programs for my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and then later a cassette unit. I also upgraded the memory to 4 kilobytes and kept the front panel so I could manually program the computer. 
I purchased my first computer program, Tiny Basic, in 1977. See my previous video for more information. I ran this computer for a while, but I got tired of using the cassette tape for saving and loading programs. I wanted one of the new five and a quarter inch floppy drives, and I bought one for $300. That was a huge purchase, and I immersed myself in designing an interface using the FD1791 floppy disk controller. After several months, I was able to get the drive to work and then I had to write my own disk operating system in machine language. However, I had no read-only memory, so I had to load the operating system into the computer each time before I could use the disk. By this time, Apple was becoming a market force, and I wanted the functionality of the Apple computer. I purchased the Apple II reference and AppleSoft manuals, and reverse engineered my computer to think it was an Apple II. I had a friend with an Apple II, and he copied the contents of his ROM chips for me onto cassette. Then I had to design and build an EEPROM programmer so I could burn the images into EEPROM. After I got the computer working as an Apple in 1983, I reconfigured the disk drives to read Apple disks, and I was finally able to run Apple programs. However, by then, the IBM PC was taking over, and I started working on other computers, including the Z80 Big Board, and other orphans. Finally, I decommissioned my 6502 computer in the late 1990s since I needed the space in my office. Although I got rid of the bulk of the computer, including the case, keyboard, and power supplies, I kept the original card cage and cards. Here's a quick tour of the cards that made up my microcomputer. This first card is the CPU card. It also handled the serial RS-232 interface. Here's the CPU chip, and this is the UART chip. It communicated with the rest of the cards over a 44-pin 40, bus. This card is what I call the Apple card. Uh, this provided the video, keyboard, cassette, and game pedal interfaces, as well as the RAS and CAS refresh signals for the dynamic RAM. The refresh signals were carried on these short ribbon cables that went over to the dynamic RAM card. This long cable here, long ribbon cable, went to the keyboard. This shielded cable went to the cassette interface. This carried a signal over to the or to the disk card, and this went over to the CPU card to get some signals. This is a 32K dynamic memory board. It was originally built as a 16K board for the TIM-based computer, and the RES and CAS refresh signals were derived from the main timing using one-shot MOLLE vibrators. However, during the Apple conversion, the board was expanded to 32K, and the signals were generated from the Apple card using the ribbon cables uh, and so then I could abandon the uh, one-shots that were uh, adjusted by these potentiometers here. This occupied the bottom half of memory from 0 to 7 FFF. And they, these, two car, these two cables, one went in here. And one went in here. This is the disk interface board. It originally used the FD1791 floppy controller chip. However, the board was completely reworked as part of the Apple conversion, and 5K of EEPROM were added. In order to make the disk drives capable of reading the Apple formatted disks, I had to cut a couple of traces on the floppy disk uh, drive printed circuit board and add a 7400 quad NAND chip. 
The EEPROM contains the upper 5K of AutoStart ROM and AppleSoft basic programs. EC00 to FFFF. This is a 10K EEPROM card that includes an EEPROM programmer. The EEPROM runs from C400 to EBFF and contains the AppleSoft Basic and Disk Operating System programs. The programmer needed 26 volts DC to complete the programming process. And I would only put, plug this in when I needed to do actual programming of the chips. Like everything else, I had to write the chip writing program in machine language since I didn't have access to an assembler. Uh, using that program, then I wrote a memory image from his friend's Apple into the EEPROM chips here. I did, would do it one at a time through that socket. This is from a front panel card. It allowed me to start and stop program execution in addition to examining and modifying memory locations. When the computer was Tim base and before it had dynamic RAM, I was able to stop the clock and single cycle the machine, but after the dynamic RAM, I could only stop execution and single step the machine. The front panel was a little console that had 24 buttons for data entry and control. It connected to the card with two ribbon cables to th these two sockets here. The display was 10 seven segment LED displays that would output the address, the data, and the keyboard register. This is a 32K static memory card. It was originally used in the TIM machine as the upper half of memory which I used during the development of the Apple computer. However, after completion of the EEPROM cards, it was depopulated to 16K and provided memory from 8000 to BFFF. These are the five volt voltage regulators, one for each of the card slots. This computer was last run in 1998, just before I dismantled it to make more room in my office. Thanks for joining me today. We took a look back at the wild, wild west era of microcomputer homebrewing. Since it was new, everybody's computer was different, and there was no compatibility between units. You had to design, build, and program any feature you wanted. There was very little communication between computer hobbyists. Remember, even a long distance telephone call could cost a buck or more. However, from those crazy early days of personal computers rose an entire digital movement that changed everybody's life. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down and leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon.